Today, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start off, I want to talk a little bit about, about my background, just to see kind of where, where I came from, how I got to where I am now. <laughs> so, this is where I kind of started off my, my career, I suppose. When I was in engineering school, I was really uh, interested in this idea of radio astronomy. So I got this job at the Algonquin Radio Observatory, which is up in Algonquin Park. It's really quite an amazing thing. This is 150 feet across here. I think, I believe they've since mothballed it, but somebody told me once this thing is so sensitive that it can actually pick up the beating, the, the same energy as a fly beating its wings on the moon, so it's quite impressive. So I'm really struck by this kind of, this kind of thing. So I got involved in the construction of the uh, radio electronics that goes into it. This is just an image of what's behind the, behind the dish. This here is a, is a receiver. And it's cooled down to four degrees Kelvin, uh, which is almost as cold as cold can get. <laughs> and this over here is a ruby crystal that is actually used as the, as the amplifier. So, uh, again, another amazing piece of equipment. Who would think that you could take a rock, put it into four degrees Kelvin, cool it down, and use it to pick up the energy fluctuations in the universe? So I was really, really struck by this. So it made me really want to get into the field, and so I did. I got into this, and I started uh, a company, an electrical engineering company, that was building microwave components. Uh, before I get into that, I wanted to actually point out to this is something interesting I just found out recently. There was a study done by, uh, by the psychological scientists Melanie Rudd and Jennifer Acker at Stanford, and another collaborator. They did three experiments, and they found out that when you experience awe, some really strange things happen. They found out that uh, people, who, when they experience awe, they feel they have more time available and were less, less impatient, which is kind of an interesting uh, result. They also found that people were more willing to volunteer their time and help others. Uh, they strongly preferred experiences over material products and experienced a greater boost in, in life satisfaction. So I think I mean, so I can't say that I volunteer my time to help others as much as I should, <laughs> but some of these things, I think, are um, ideas that artists probably experience all the time when they're working, uh, when they're working because both art and science, I think, really brings us these experiences of awe. So I just want to throw that out there at the beginning, just to th be thinking about it as we go along and uh, talk. So back to my engineering days, and I, I got into this company, it's called Millennium Microwave at the time, and I got building these electronic circuits, these microwave circuits, which actually were quite interesting because if you were working on this circuit and you just go and put your hand just near it, suddenly all the characteristics of the circuit change. So it's kind of considered a, a black magic art of, of engineering. Uh, you really can't predict what's happening on the circuit at 20 gigahertz, really high frequencies. But anyway, I started building these black boxes that went into systems, microwave systems. And so I started to get a little bored eventually of this. So I wanted to kind of make a change in my life. And at the same time, I was, oh yeah, since it was Halloween last night, I thought, I've got to throw this up. <laughs> a little costume for you, you didn't get enough. This was back in the day. I was doing a lot of dance and performance. I started a dance company with some people in, in Ottawa. And so I wanted to figure out, wow, you know, I'm really enjoying this performance stuff. I do like engineering, but what would happen if I combined the two? And is there a way to do that? So I did it. Miraculously, <laughs> I actually went to OCAD and I started kind of shifting my brain cells around a bit. I started doing, doing artworks. This is just me with some earlier works at the Ontario College of Art and Design. What year? Whew, this was back in 92, <laughs> I think is when I graduated. So back, back some time ago. Uh, I got out, I started to, to realized I had another student loan to pay off. I'd already paid off my engineering loan, but I went to OCAD, had another loan. So I got into the film industry to try to pay off my bills. I worked on lots of science fiction films, like Johnny Mnemonic and all these other films. Did all kinds of crazy projects, like Flamethrowers for Kiss, <laughs> which was kind of neat. And I, interestingly enough, uh, Britney Spears used it, but she used it with a smoke machine to turn the flames into smoke. So she was a little bit uh, more nervous about it than Kiss. Anyway, that was, so that was a fun project. So I got into all of these kind of interesting things, but I still had this passion for performance. So I, I came together with a collective, um, we called it Twitch Limbic. Some of you may know some of these performers. This is Susanna Hood, uh, Nilan Pereira, Catherine Duncanson. Uh, Suzanne is a, a dancer, Nilan's an avant-garde musician, uh, 
Catherine is a performance artist. So we did this piece called Feel Here Secret. Uh, you can see it there. It's an episodic collage exploring the theme of intimacy in all its subtle forms. So we wanted to create a, we wanted to create a piece that kind of accentuated the central relationship of the body. We wanted to try to do it in kind of a wordless way and try to, so I wanted to use electronics and technology and so on to do that. So this is just an example of one of the, the pieces we did. In this uh, piece here, you see these dancers, they're wearing this EMG system I, bu I built, which is, picks up the electrical signal of the muscles. So as the dancers were moving, it would amplify the electrical signal in their muscles, and then that would control both lights and motors and things. So on stage, they could be moving, and the lights would be uh, reacting to, their, to their electrical, the electrical signal of their body, which I thought was pretty, pretty neat. Um, I could actually sit back and watch the light show and, and know what muscles the dancers were activating by how the lights were working on stage. So it's you know, very intimate in that, in that sense. So that was really an interesting, interesting project. In this piece, there was a breath sensor that would detect uh, as Susanna breathed and skirt would kind of move in synchronicity with, with her breath. So all these things that would kind of bring the body out into, into space more uh, and reveal these intimacies. Just a couple other images from that show. We also used ultrasonic sensors, so as you approach the screen uh, forward and backwards, you could control sound with your body as you're moving towards the uh, images. I also worked on another project uh, called The Girl with uh, No Dorner in the Mouth, and this is uh, Fidesz Kruker, who's an amazing, uh, I guess you call it new opera singer. She comes from this interesting lineage. Uh, her teacher actually, um, her teacher studied with somebody who used to be a stretcher bearer and during the Second World War, they'd carry out these people who were dying on stretches and realized the sounds that were being emitted from the body were so different than, they'd heard, than he'd heard before. So tried to kind of work on that idea that you can take sounds from the body that just you'd never, never hear. So Fidesz is part of that lineage and she's had these teachers who have taught her these really extended, really interesting vocal techniques. So in this piece, there were actually three, three pieces as part of this uh, exhibition, uh, this, this opera. And I got involved in the lighting and set design. We actually were quite successful with it. It won two Dora Awards for set design and lighting award, which is the kind of theater uh, Oscars in Toronto, if you want to think of it that way. And so I, I developed all kinds of different uh, lighting techniques, little motorized lights that would move around the space. It's this sort of line of lights in the background. Uh, one of the pieces was based on 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. So I created this sort of uh, backdrop with these, with these lights that would reflect the luminescence in the water. I don't know if you know the story, but there's this one point where Captain Nemo comes out on the deck and these creatures are glowing in the, in the water. So we kind of tried to recreate that, that ambiance. Um, so that was another kind of interesting collaboration. In this case, I, all, all these cases, all the performance work, everything that I do pretty well is interdisciplinary in the sense that I'm working with people uh, from different disciplines. In this case, there were two architects who worked on this, this piece. This background scrim is a laser cut uh, piece of um, kind of a mylar piece. And if you got, look close to it, it's kind of a gill-like. It very much represents the uh, gills and fish. So it was uh, interesting. And also Darren Copeland, some of you might know Darren's work, who works with diffuse sound. So we created this really interesting atmosphere in the space. Um, this, this piece here called Sync came out of uh, a book. I don't know if any of you have read this book. It's, it's a fascinating book by Stephen Strogatz. Uh, it's called uh, Sync, the Emerging Science of Synchronization, uh, Spontaneous Order. <laughs> That's right. Stephen Strogatz is a, a physicist, mathematician, uh, scientist who studies how, how systems of nature naturally synchronize. And he looks at all kinds of, all kinds of systems. Um, for example, he, he looks at uh, fireflies, seizures, um, crowds, how crowds suddenly can start clapping and the clapping will become synchronous. Yeah, women, when they're living together, often their menstrual cycles will sync up. Uh, and like I said, these, there's these fireflies, I'll actually show you a little video of it. These fireflies that will suddenly start flashing in unison. 
So Stephen Strogatz looks at these, the study of uh, coupled oscillators, how these things suddenly will synchronize together kind of magically. And for me, I was really inspired by this to, to, to understand how this, how this worked. So I want to uh, create, a, create a piece on it. And I think this is, I don't know, it's probably really hard to see in this light. <laughs> but you may see here how these fireflies will suddenly, they'll be, I don't know if you can see it back there, probably difficult. Suddenly you'll see them all, they'll all start uh, flashing and synchronous. And this happens not with all fireflies, so you won't see this in Ontario fireflies, but if you go to Asia, there's a certain uh, species of fireflies, and there's this one place in Washington State where people come by busload and busload to watch this really amazing kind of orchestration of fireflies. So I was really inspired by this idea. So I created a piece called Sync, and this again was a collaboration. It was a collaboration with uh, Camille Turner, actually Hamilton, hometown Hamilton girl, also known as Miss Canadiana, if any of you know her artwork. Uh, so we created this piece called Sync. There's 216 nodes of, of light in there, and they're supported from circuit boards on the ceiling. Um, it's probably easiest to show you the, the video of it to kind of understand how it works. But basically, it's based on this computer model here. If you think of these 216 nodes in space being separated by a spring and a damping constant, you can think of the damping constant as fluid. So if you have two particles in space and there's fluid flowing through them and there's a spring attached to them, and you imagine all these things attached together, and you imagine this external force coming in and hitting hitting a node somewhere in, the, in, this, in this cube, in this model. What happens to all the other particles in space? So this is a, kind of an automaton that was inspired by SYNC. So the idea that one rea uh, interaction somewhere will have a big effect somewhere else in the space. And uh, so this is what happens in the physical world. But what I did is I want to model that in kind of a computer world and represent it through lights. So here, for example, is a computer simulation of if this was in space and it was uh, really, really happening, if these were particles, this is sort of what it would look like. This is just a, a screenshot of the simulation that I did in order to design the real piece. So you'll see there's a little force comes in and hits, and the rest of the particles react. Down here, there's a huge force that came up and hit the, hit the cube somewhere, and then eventually it all settles back to kind of a stasis point. The springs kind of come back together. And so this kind of happens continuously, and everything's randomized. So I have no idea when the force is going to come in and hit the cube, and what the viscosity of the fluid in between all these particles is, what the spring constant is. It's all constantly changing. So I couldn't build this in space. It would be really too difficult. So what I did is I took the forces that each of these particles felt, and I represented it by light. And this is what, uh, what that looks like. Sink contains a six-foot cube of 216 light pods. Each pod contains an amber LED. The intensity of the lights is controlled by a computer running a simulation of a cube filled with a viscous fluid in which 216 particles attached to each other by springs are floating. The computer injects random forces coming from random directions into various parts of the cube. The force causes the particles to move around and bump into each other. The viscosity of the fluid is also randomly changed by the computer. The computer sends out information which is carried through cables to small circuit boards hanging on a grid above the installation. Each LED has a separate address. When information from the computer arrives at its address, the LED follows the instructions. The result is a mesmerizing display of forces commonly found in nature, like fire or wind on a field. The patterns that ripple through the cube never repeat themselves. I thought that was kind of an interesting observation in the end. So next I want to show you a piece called Animate, and this again is another co collaboration. This is with an architect uh, slash designer, Marion Trinkle from uh, Amsterdam. We also worked with a sound composer, Leon Speck. Uh, and this was done at the, the Gasthaus Theater in Amsterdam. We, Marianne and I had worked together a couple times in a, actually a, a coal mine in Germany. There's this really interesting residency that happens over there. We met this, uh, this coal mine. 
So we had this, this issue that we wanted, to, we wanted to work with. We wanted to work with these three questions, I guess. How do you create the illusion of movement on a static screen? How does one animate an image to become three-dimensional? And what if this image re resists its manipulation? So this is what we came up with. We came up with this, uh, this project here called Animate. Basically, it's a 15-foot tall spandex screen with these uh, air cylinders that are attached to the screen through long cables. And it's manipulable either manually through a, through a keyboard or use, most of the time it's actually computer controlled. So I used various software to control the screen. And uh, it was also synced up to the sound that the sound designer did. That's another uh, image. So you can see what we do is we project images on it and in space, um, the image would come, come out and it was, it was actually quite evocative and a little bit, in a way, a bit freaky maybe, depending on the images that we used. But you can kind of get a, a sense of what we're trying to do. We want to, again, make this two-dimensional image into a three-dimensional uh, shape. Then a, it became a sound piece, I guess. The, the sound was actually something that I was surprised by. So in this case, the eyes and the mouth were all uh, pulled out in space. and syn synchronized with uh, video. This was an interesting project because it's, it's one of those kind of, it's an unfinished project in a way because we created this thing and this thing actually became an instrument, like, like even like sync, I guess. It's something you can, you, once you have the structure and you have this thing, you can actually do a lot more with it than just what it was originally designed for. So it's a project I'd hopefully like to get back to at some point and, and work on again. Because um, a lot of things that we'd like to uh, move forward on that. I'm going to move forward now and uh, talk, get into talking about subtle technologies. We're talking about my own work now. I want to kind of move into, this is the evolution of, of this festival, subtle technologies I'm going to talk more about. And here you see uh, images of the magnetosphere or the northern lights, there's this really interesting thing you can do. You can take a really long wire as an antenna, stick it out in, uh, in, in a zone that is sort of electrically quiet, put it through an amplifier, and you'll hear these really amazing sounds that are co coming from the magnetosphere around the Earth. And this is just an example by uh, Stephen McGreevy of what that sounds like. And this is totally unaltered. So they're really kind of unworldly sounds. Okay, so I got really intrigued by this and I built a receiver to do this. And uh, it, it was interesting. It worked well outside of the city, but once I brought it in town, it wouldn't work at all because of the electrical noise and so on. And I, I met a, a friend of uh, mine, Pamela Brown, and she had just come back from England doing this tour on standing stones and we decided we want to make a space in downtown Toronto that kind of reflected what what we think people were trying to do with standing stones. We wanted to create a space in downtown Toronto using the technology of our time uh, that would kind of be this sacred sacred space so to speak and there were things we wanted to do with technology we didn't know how to do how to do it so we decided let's get some experts some scientists together and some artists let's have this weekend where we'd actually have a kind of a jam session. So we did that, and that was the first uh, Subtle Technologies. And so Subtle Technologies, which I'll tell you more about in a minute, was born uh, at InterAccess in Toronto in 1997, and it continues to this day. Here we are 16 years later, and I'm still doing it. I had no idea I'd be doing it this long, but uh, I just can't stop, I guess. <laughs> anyway, so Subtle Technology was born, and uh, Subtle Technologies, this is sort of our our mission statement brings people together to promote wonder and cite creativity and spark innovation across disciplines. A couple other taglines, we blur the boundaries between art and science and it's a place where art and science meet. So what is Subtle Technologies? It's a, 
laboratory for interdisciplinary exchange, although it's not a physical library, it's a <laughs> laboratory. It's a space, it's a meeting point for artists and scientists to come together and share, share their ideas. Specifically, practice-based research presentations is interesting to us. We really want people to share their tools, so scientists to come and share the tools and techniques that, that they use. It can be a place to disclose controversial ideas. We've had uh, scientists come that would not talk to their peers about what, they, what they're doing in some cases, because they could get you know, shunned by them. So they've actually presented it at Subtle Technologies, which is an interesting place. Uh, provides for an emergency of, of ideas and practices. So it is an annual festival. Some years we have themes, some years we don't have themes. Next year's theme is immortality, so you can be thinking about that. We're funded through arts councils. Uh, we're a registered charitable organization. And we have an interdisciplinary board, so architect, physicist, anthropologist, engineer, lawyer, media artist. So we kind of live and breathe what we, what we show. Um, so it's a really intimate place. I mean, we, we have typically small audiences because there are not that many people who are really interested in art and science coming together. There should be, I think, but, but it's, it's an intimate, kind of a close, uh, close space. We like to keep it that way. So why do we do this? Because we, we really believe that it's important to bring artists and scientists together to create new ideas and techniques. Uh, it, it also allows us a window into what scientists are experimenting with. Uh, and it gives scientists an idea of uh, sort of the culture of their time. I think it's really, really important that artists are familiar with the work of artists, or, sorry, scientists are familiar with the work of artists as well, so we, uh, we really believe that's important. As well, it allows artists and scientists a way to disseminate the work. Sometimes scientists sort of work away in their lab and doesn't, they, nobody hears about the work they do, so subtle technology is an important thing to, uh, important place for them to, to do that, to, to to reach out. And it's a meeting place to develop further collaborations. And that's really the, the most important thing, is, is the idea of uh, creating these collaborations. And some people say, well, why bring artists and scientists together? Well, they're actually very similar. Some people don't realize, but both artists and scientists are explorers. They're, they're kind of reaching out and exploring the world, but in different, different ways, possibly. Um, so I think, I think you often see scientists come to the festival and they're wearing their suit and tie and then at the end they've actually relaxed and <laughs> calmed down and really uh, find, find that they're among their, their peers in a way or among their kind. So I think that's kind of, kind of interesting. Um, we kind of think that in order to do these big, pro big interesting projects, it really is important to bring both art and science together. I mean, even CERN, you know, the biggest experiment uh, in the world, the Large Hadron Collider has just started a program where they're bringing artists in, and uh, so I think it's I think it's important that we bring these people together. I think something that we probably all realize that artists are freer to explore, however, than scientists. I think scientists, you know, are typically pushed down this narrow narrow stream, and so I guess the question comes, you know, what is in it for scientists? Well, I think. I think it's important that scientists can see their work through a different lens. There's this clip that sometimes I play, this woman who presented there, and she starts her whole talk off by saying how amazing it is that she now looks at her work in a totally new way, having come to subtle technologies, and it forced her to think about her work in a different way. So I think, I really think that's important. Um, one of the people I'm going to talk about a bit later, actually, Stephen Morris, who's a physicist and has come to subtle technology a lot now, just met with me the other day and says he really wants to bring his stuff into a gallery. So I think it's, uh, it's interesting in that way that subtle technologies can affect people in that way. Uh, Welcome Trust is this big scientific organization in the, in the UK. They had an artist program for a while and they did a, a survey which they found that after scientists worked with artists, the scientists were much more willing to take risks, which I thought was kind of interesting that they were a bit careful before, but then once they worked with, science, with artists, they would go out into the world and go back to their research lab and actually be a bit more riskier. Which, so I thought that was an interesting, interesting thing. Um, so art, art science, I think one of the things we have to keep in mind, other, you know, unlike science, science can be very goal-oriented, right? But I think when you bring artists and scientists together, you should not try to force these goals on people. I think it's, it's often about the networks that you create, and that's what we believe at Subtle Technologies. We're not necessarily looking for, we bring these people together and create something. I think it's the networks, I think, that is really important to foster. So that's something I want to mention. Um, 
So there's lots of roadblocks, of course, in art science and the idea of bringing artists and science together. Something that I just recently learned is that science, the Latin for science, means to take apart, to separate, whereas the Latin meaning of art actually means to join. So they're kind of already, there's a big uh, disjunction there, but, but they're complementary. So I thought that was, that was interesting. And uh, I think, you know, scientists have this, this uh, they're forced kind of to, if you want to get tenure, you have to go down this narrow, narrow stream. But if you want to work in transdisciplinary work or interdisciplinary work, you have to kind of be able to go off on these streams that aren't traveled. So how do you fund these things? Even our festival, Subtle Technologies, we have trouble getting funding because uh, we don't always fit under the arts category. We don't always fit under the science category. So I think when you do this kind of work, it's, it's, there's, there's all kinds of challenge to it. Uh, there's another interesting thing that I just found out about. There's a study done by, uh, what's his name, Roberts Roots Bernstein, Department of Physiology at Michigan State U. He surveyed Nobel Prize winners, uh, different royal, the Royal Society of Science, all these uh, scientists. And the study found really interestingly that any of the scientists who got Nobel Prize, the majority of scientists who got Nobel Prize had an arts and crafts background as a young, when they were young. So starting off with Nobel Prize winners, they had the most, and then the Royal Society had also had a lot, but less. So it, it seems like, interestingly enough, the scientists who really you know, get out there and do new ideas actually have an arts background in some way. So I thought that was kind of, kind of an interesting thing. So, so all these things to say that I think it's, it's really important to bring artists and scientists together. So how do, we, how do we do that? Well, one of the big things that we do is we create these workshops. And this is a workshop we did at the University of Toronto with, uh, these are two physicists, Stephen Morris and Robert Deegan, who work in nonlinear physics. And Charles Sowers is a very lucky guy who's the artist in residence at the Exploratorium in San Francisco. So here we see a bunch of, of artists in Stephen's lab looking at, these are called the uh, Kaladny plates. You vibrate them at a certain frequency and you'll get these different patterns depending on the frequency that you vibrate the, uh, the plates at. You just pour sand on it. So really, really interesting to artists who are interested in patterns and sound. This is a project that Stephen's working on. These are icicles in the background. Stephen's looking at why is it that icicles have these ripples on them that are very specific frequency. So maybe you guys don't look at icicles closely, but take a look at icicles and you'll see that they're very, very specific in the ridges that form in icicles. And why does that happen? So, so Stephen looks at patterns in nature and why do ripples in sand happen with a certain regularity? Um, he does a lot of stuff for Discovery Channel, maybe some of you have seen him, but one of the projects that he showed on there not too long ago was ripples, or sorry, uh, washboards and roads. What causes washboards and roads, nobody knew, but Stephen did these experiments to find out. So, really interesting guy. These are other kind of nonlinear patterns that form. This is a chemical, this is a chemical reaction uh, called beltov zivinsky I'm trying to remember the exact name. And these are, these are different, two different densities of particles of sand. When you mix them together and spin them, they'll create stripes. So all these really interesting uh, patterns that form in nature. Another workshop we did is on tissue culture engineering. So we brought artists into a bio lab, taught them how to, uh, how to grow tissues, uh, which I think is, is important because there's a lot of work happening in science in terms of creating artificial, artificial life. And actually, you'll hear a lot more about this from Jennifer Willett, so I won't talk too much about it. But uh, it's a really interesting, interesting workshop we did. This is an image of when you grow cells onto a, a scaffold, onto a structure. These are cells that artists grew. You have to somehow shake it off and liberate the cells. So the, <laughs> the lab technician just happened to play tuba. And uh, so this got really, him really excited in working with artists that he had, a, he had a window in, which is always really important. Uh, this, is, this is Oran Katz, who led the workshop from Symbiotica in Australia. Really, really interesting artist. Uh, and this is some of his work and uh, Ayanat Zur's. Um, they're both, they both work together at Symbiotic in Australia. And we're going to actually be doing another workshop with them in the spring um, in Ottawa. So if anybody's interested, I think you'd probably want to take part in this. This is an image of a little, a little coat that he grew out of tissue. Uh, the, the piece is called Victimus, Victimus Leather. And I guess his idea is he wants to explore how humans treat treat the other, 
Um, it's, it's also garment on the, the garment industry and uh, you know the materials used in, in making garments and so on. But anyway, very, very interesting artist. He also did another project, uh, was it called the Victimus, uh, uh, Victimus Dining, something like that, on oh, no, a disembodied cuisine. He grew frog steaks. So he took frog cells off of a frog and actually grew steaks that people sat around a table and ate. So these were, uh, these were steaks that didn't come from a live animal. So again, he's making this comment on, is it possible to eat meat without killing animals? And it actually turns out that a lot of the industry of, of tissue engineering actually kills a lot of animals, which I didn't, which I didn't realize, but it was, it's an interesting fact that, that way. Um, okay, so moving on, we also have workshops on kind of media art. So in this case, this was a media artist who taught people how to hack into networks. Uh, Byron would probably like this. Um, he actually won the, uh, the the major prize at Arts Electronica as he was at Subtle Technologies, which was interesting. Uh, we have workshops in uh, do-it-yourself do it plastics. So these are using kind of household materials. You can make some really interesting plastics with that. Uh, this year we had a workshop on slime mold, which was pretty fun. <laughs> We also did a workshop at the Primitive Institute of Astrophysics. Anybody who hasn't been there, you should really go. It's really an amazing, both architecturally an interesting building, but it's interesting to see how scientists work, work there. The whole, all the floors, there's blackboards everywhere and fireplaces. It's like the most comfy uh, research institute I've ever seen. And so we, we brought artists into in to meet physicists there. And the interesting thing about this project was it wasn't, an outreach project for a Permanent Institute, but they considered it as an in-reach project. So what they wanted to do is they wanted to bring artists into their research space to stimulate scientists, which I think is an interesting thing to think about it, because we're always thinking about it the other way around, that scientists are doing outreach by coming to subtle technologies. But so actually bringing artists in there. So uh, this is Lee Smolin, who is pretty, pretty famous. He's written some really interesting books on quantum gravity and uh, problems with string theory. We had another talk on symmetry and how symmetry in physics works and different types of symmetry in nature. This is neat. At Perimeter, they use a hockey stick as a pointer, uh, <laughs> which is very Canadian, I thought. Uh, this fellow down here has developed a new way of create of a new language for, develop, for discussing quantum physics. So rather than using equations, he's got to come up with a really neat system. We also had a networking session where we we teamed up artists with, with uh, physicists to have this sort of uh, networking lunch. We brought in a, an artist from Amsterdam, Dimitri Gelfand, who's a very interesting artist who, uh, who works in physics. So it, it was important for us to bring an artist into their space to kind of do a talk and uh, show them the kind of work that, that artists are doing working, working with physics. And you can, this is an image of their piece called uh, Camera, actually they work together, Evelina Dominic and Dimitri Gelfand, uh, these, these two work together to create these really subtle works. I, I think of them as very subtle works. And this is, uh, explores sonoluminescence. So you actually go into the space and in this bell jar, if you look closely enough, you'll see these sort of ethereal glow and it works by using ultrasonic uh, transducers that kind of stimulate this, this uh, sonoluminescence. They don't actually know how it completely works. It's kind of amazing that science quite hasn't figured this out. But you have to be in the space for about 10 minutes before your eyes get used to it and you can actually see it. So he works with these kind of subtle uh, processes. This is called hydrogeny. They, it's, uh, they're using hydrolysis, so separating hydrogen from water and then shining white lasers through it. And they're able to see these really interesting vortex that create as they, uh, over time. And as I would, if I have more time later, I can show you a really beautiful video of it. We also did a workshop at the uh, Neuroimaging Lab at the University of Western Ontario. So we brought artists in to teach them how to use the fMRI systems. Uh, I didn't realize, but you actually, when you go into an fMRI space like this, every piece of metal has to come off your body. And she, uh, this is Jody Collin, the scientist, telling us about that. So even a nickel or you know, change in your pockets will go flying across the room and possibly take somebody's eye out. So 
we introduced artists not just to the machine but also the software. So artists got to use the software, fMRI software, and uh, under try to understand how technicians decipher the images. We actually wanted to bring artists into the machine, but there's an ethical issue. They worried that if we did put somebody in and there was a tumor or something that they found, how do you actually deal with that? So things, things come up that you don't really think about beforehand. So they used one of their lab people who they know doesn't have a tumor and <laughs> could go in and you know, they didn't have to give them any bad news. So, Oh, this is just me geeking out at the back end of what an fMRI machine looks like to, <laughs> to drive it. It's pretty fascinating to see that. So looking at 3D uh, fMRI imaging as well, different techniques uh, for, for reading brain waves, so ENGs. And also at Subtle Technologies, we have a lot of exhibitions, some kind of more traditional that you may see at media art galleries, but this one is kind of different. Uh, this is one, for example, where we used, uh, where we took a medical anthropologist and we created a, an installation based on his work. He looks at the kidney trade in India and how they're taking kidneys out of people and uh, selling them. And so we create an installation around that. So we have all kinds of other events. We have a symposium, for example. This is this year uh, an artist talking about her work on motion studies. Uh, she works with scientists and looks at the fluid dynamics around birds as they're flying, creates video work. Uh, this is a performance we had this year called uh, Experiments Where Logic and Emotion Collide. And this is a company from, the, from uh, Vancouver called Link Dance. And they work with uh, evolutionary biologists. And this is actually a scientist who is part of the performance. So again, we're focusing on these things where scientists and artists are really, really working together. And the piece itself is about is looking at dance and people and motion as sort of an evolutionary biolog biology process. So everything was kind of uh, tied in together. We have poster sessions, which is typically what you would see at uh, a scientific conference, but this allows us to bring more people in and all kinds of demos and so on. Uh, performances. A new initiative that we've started over the last couple of years is this idea of speed networking for artists and scientists. So we bring them in, everybody has five minutes to talk to each other and then they, they move on. So you get to meet a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of people that way. We have a thing called Art Science Camp, where I would actually love to do this in Hamilton at McMaster, where it's much of a more of an informal thing. We bring artists and scientists, and people, it's, uh, people just get to choose what they want to talk about. It's not curated in any way, so an artist will just write on a board something they want to talk about. A scientist will write something on a board, and then use dotmocracy, if anybody have heard of that. You just put a dot on what you want to hear, and then we have these breakout sessions. So it allows for a lot of, lot of uh, interaction. Uh, this is just some of the ideas that we, uh, that we explored in the last, last one. And again, these are all people just judging on what they want to hear. Something we did last year, which was kind of neat, is we were invited by the Canadian Science Policy Conference to introduce their scientists and their science policy people to media artwork which I think was a pretty, uh, pretty neat thing to do because often you know, some of these people have just never been to galleries, so it was neat. So we've showcased Herman Colgan's dust. If anybody knows Herman Colgan, he's actually an amazing uh, artist from Montreal. Uh, his, his work, dust, he kind of works as a scientist. He's, he uses high-speed cameras and microscopes, and he's also a sound artist, so he creates these these collages of sound and images that it's just, uh, I don't know, it kind of blows you away how, I don't know, it's, it's anyway, it's, it's very much all. <laughs> if you remember what we talked about before, time stopped there. So just a little bit about what we're doing in the future. Uh, this spring we're going to go to Montreal and we have a, an event that we're doing in collaboration with Continuum Contemporary Music. That's a Toronto-based contemporary music ensemble. We're going to bring together five artists, five composers, and five scientists. This will happen at Hexagram at Concordia. And so we're really looking forward to seeing this. One of the problems with subtle technologies is people often come together and then they disappear. We don't know what they do together, you know, like what actual connections are made. So this one we're kind of enforcing it. <laughs> we're putting people together and we're going to track it. We're going to actually commission works that come out of this, uh, this, this weekend of, with artists and scientists. So even though they just have a little bit of time to work together, we'll be applying for more funding to actually create, uh, 
create pieces. They could end up as installations. They could be uh, sound pieces. We don't really know what uh, what it's going to be. So, looking forward to that. Just quickly, some challenges that we have to deal with. Like everybody is funding. As I mentioned, the follow up with participants. It's hard to know what the actual effect is. You know, after somebody comes to Subtle Technologies, who meets up and ends up collaborating down the road. We really don't know that. This is a big issue for us, is the, the diversity question. I mean, science and the kind of work that we see in art science tends to not have much diversity in terms of culture, so that, that's something we really want to kind of work on and foster. Audience is always a challenge because it is so kind of unique. The, you know, if we get a review in the paper, it, is it going to be from the arts side or is it going to be from the science side? So the arts uh, reviewers don't want to touch us, the science reviewers don't want to touch us, we're too artsy and so on. So all these, these challenges. The, a big one here is reaching scientists too. Like we, uh, that's one of my biggest jobs is going out and trying to find scientists that we have to reel in to come to subtle technologies and convince them that there is real benefits and it's a really unique and interesting place for them to come. So, so yeah, so I want to just uh, tie up there and say thank you very much. <laughs> There's uh, any questions? <laughs>